the people will write and say, look, you've got, you've got about one chance left now. Aren't you going to take it? I'm writing to you as a friend. <laughs> <laughs>
Millions of people died in Afghanistan because we didn't intervene there, because we left the country, because we abandoned it after the war against the Soviet Union was over. Millions of people died in Iraq because we left Saddam Hussein in power in 1991. Uh, who knows how many millions of lives in, in Iran have been made miserable. We certainly know how many people were killed in the war uh, with Iraq because the theocracy was left un undisturbed there. Are we proud of the way that we neglected and abandoned uh, Somalia uh, to its fate in the way that we did? No, and all of this neglect and indifference and neutrality is what's led to the rise of the terrorist organizations. And you only have to look at what bin Laden says himself. He said defeating the Soviet Union was really hard. He says it at the wedding of his, one of his ghastly kids to one of Ayman Zawahiri's filthy brood. Um, it's a very important tape to listen to. He said many of us here lost many good friends in the great struggle to liberate Afghanistan from the Soviets. That was really hard fighting. This was, that was a real jihad. That was really a bitter war. He said, but bringing down the next empire, the American one, that'll be relatively easy. They're feminized. They're queer. They're run by Jews and usurers. They don't want to fight. They don't believe in their own principles. They don't think anything's worth fighting for. They can't take casualties. Bring it on. We'll take them down easily. That'll be simple. It, it is to me fantastically important, and really of the first and highest importance, that that statement and the assumptions underlying it be comprehensively disproved, comprehensively disproved, and their authors, those who make excuses for them, comprehensively destroyed. That's going to be the big fight between uh, secularism and civilization and its enemies from now on. You better get ready for it. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to get good people to do wicked things, you need religion. What do I mean by that? I mean to say that who, when they see a newborn baby arriving in their life, if anyone's ever thought, even myself, well, maybe there is something to this. Look at the, look at the perfection of this little bundle. But, but they said, I tell you what, though, before we go any further, we need to get a sharp knife or a stone from somewhere and start hacking away the genitalia of this little bundle. Because if we don't, we uh, won't be doing God's will. Now, where is... No moral person would do such a thing unless they thought it was divinely warranted. Though it's put in a nice way, it's, it's, it's part of a phenomenon that I've always thought of as very disgusting, which is the belief of the religious that, which they keep expressing and have done for centuries, that surely now you're dying, your fears will overcome your reason. I hope I don't have to underline what's horrible about that. There's an element of blackmail to it. And an element also of tremendous insecurity, I think, on their part. I mean, they don't, they don't seem to feel they'd win the argument so easily with someone who was mentally and physically strong. By the way, I think they're right. Christopher, I've, I've got to call you down on refer, referring to circumcision as genital mutilation. My son cried more at his first haircut than he did at his bris. And statistically... You weren't doing it right then. <laughs> statistically, the, the only long-term effect that it seems to have on people is it increases their chances of winning a Nobel Prize. I can't, um, I can't find the, the um, compulsory uh, mutilation of the genitals of children as subject for humor in that way, or flippancy in that way. What if a Muslim was to say to you just now, my little girl cried more at her first haircut than when I cut off her clitoris? What would you think of me if I was to say? such a disgusting thing that a person as humane as yourself can sit here and be and think of that as a fit subject for humor shows what I mean religion makes morally normal people say and do disgusting and wicked things and you've just proved my point for me. but there is no no way you can take a step from the laws of physics the observable creation of the cosmos uh, that leads you to the belief that there is an intervening personal God there is no possible way, no one's even tried it, of getting from the laws of physics or biology to any such idea. So from de uh, the person who says, I'm a deist, I don't think all of this can be an accident, there must be some cosmic force, I say, I can't disprove it, though I think the cosmos functions without it, but you have all your work, sir, or ma'am, still ahead of you, before you can say that Jesus of Nazareth was a real person, let alone that he was the son of God, let alone that his mother was a virgin, let alone that he was resurrected. None of these things, by the way, would prove he was the son of God, if they did happen. What is this? 
It's not physics. Okay? It's not biology. It's not science. It's faith. Why don't you fly under your true flag, sir? Why don't you say these things must be believed as articles of faith? Don't try and derive it from science. The argument for theism, that there, not only can we establish this prime mover's existence, but we can show by some form of induction that he intervenes in wars, that he answers prayers, that he cares who we sleep with and in what position, uh, that uh, what food we eat and on what days, is a ridiculous proposition. It's a claim to a truth that no primate can claim to make. Primates who claim to know it should be distrusted. Great damage has been done and continues to be done by such people and by, and by such ideas. You're better off thinking for yourself and taking all the risks and, I might add, all the pleasures that will come from that. The most overrated of the virtues is faith. The metaphysical claims of religion are untrue. Thank you. There are also people who say, it's God's curse on me that I should have it near my throat because that was the organ of blasphemy which I used for so many years. And I've used many other organs to blaspheme as well if it comes to that. I would posit to you, Christopher, that there is no fundamental difference between what the Israelites did to the Amalekites and their surrounding neighbors or enemies than what the United States did justly in going into Iraq, whether we did it principally for moral reasons. It certainly had a moral... Uh, can you possibly for one second be morally serious as a human being and say that? Well, yes, I can. We, we fulfill what, can we, we, what Iraqis did we exterminate? What Iraqis did we enslave? What Iraqi virgins did we keep for our soldiers? having killed the, the rest of their families. Well, what, what are you talking about, sir? But that's yes, what you, I took, said. you took up all the time for my answer with your long, rather unlettered question. Oh. Well, I, I want to make it clear in our closing moments here, Christopher. I don't consider you an enemy. I don't consider you... Uh, but I'm very sorry to hear that. Well, I know, because you want me to be your enemy. You're well, you want, no, you, excuse me, you are my enemy. Well, but you're not my enemy. Uh, I, 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 How are you going to figure that? No, because I don't feel a need to have to silence Christopher Hitchens. Oh, well, it, you don't have a chance of doing that. I don't mean that at all, but I mean your, your, your preachments are evil and they're a direct threat to the survival of civilization. So you, if you don't consider me an enemy, you don't know an enemy when you see or hear one. Against the motion, Christopher Hitchens. Um, those who ask uh, confessions from other people should be willing to make one oneself. I am obsessed with sex. <laughs> Ever since I discovered that my God-given male member was going to give me no peace, I decided to give it no rest in return. <laughs> Seems fair to me. Now, two people asked me to be very quick and do world poverty and the Holocaust, and I'll do that. There is only one cure to, for world poverty that's ever been found or ever will be, and it's very simple. It's, and it can be phrased very simply, too. It's called the empowerment of women. Go to Bangladesh or Bolivia. I have to ask you to hold your applause, though I love you. Um, go to Bangladesh or Bolivia, give women control over their reproductive cycle, uh, give them a, throw in a handful of corn if you can, uh, make them not just the, the beasts of burden and the beasts of childbearing that they become, and the floor will rise, it just will. It never fails anywhere. Against this one solution, the Catholic Church has set its face. The efforts of the missionary church in the third world mean more people die, not less. It's as simple as that. More famine, more disease, more ignorance, more random and avoidable death. To the Holocaust, sir. That the church preached that the Jewish people were collectively responsible for the death of Christ until 1964, till nearly 20 years after the Nuremberg trials, may or may not have something to do with the availability of a reservoir of anti-Jewish hatred in countries like Poland, Spain, Italy, Germany, Austria, and elsewhere. I think it does have something to do with it, okay? Um, the Ten Commandments, three of them are awe-inspiring. They're about being afraid of a totalitarian figure. Three of them are ordinary morality. We know of no code of ethics ever found, that, and the Archbishop bears me out on this, that recommends murder, um, theft, or perjury. Uh, putting adultery on the same level as that um, may not be morally advisable. Um, saying that covetousness should uh, be considered in the same light as a, as a crime, in other words, a thought crime, you're condemned now for something you're thinking, and it may be something that leads you to enterprise and emulation. That's forbidden too. That's very, very iffy, it seems to me, and there's a very iffy part of it which lumps those you mustn't covet 
in with the animals and the chattels and your property, and those who it lumps in are your women folk. And do you, are you seriously expect to, to uh, be taken seriously if you say that that commandment that does re reduce women to beasts of burden and child bearers and chattel has nothing to do with the appalling position of women, not just in poorer societies, but in ours as well. Again, for shame if you can feel it. Now, unanswered questions, amazing. I asked, where is Cardinal Law, Bernard Law, and why? I have an authority here, he ducks the question. Um, Anne Whittacombe, um, sorry, I've got one more thing to say about that. Um, he also says that the church advises against homosexuality. It teaches against it, no it doesn't, any more than it teaches against divorce or contraception. Where it can, it bans these things and punishes them and writes them into the criminal code. If all you were doing, sir, ma'am, were offering advice, we could probably be fine with it. No one, though they were asked repeatedly, would say whether they thought Stephen Fry, my friend, was in a state of mortal sin or not. They wouldn't tell you. Something about the question brought out their inner coward. Well, I say that homosexuality is not just a form of sex, it's a form of love, and it deserves our respect for that reason. That if, if when, I, when my children were young, I'd have been proud to have Stephen as their babysitter, and I'd told them they were lucky. And if anyone came to my door as a babysitter wearing holy orders, I'd call first a cab and then the police. <laughs> And, and, and it's your fault, sir and ma'am, it's your fault that that's true and that everybody knows it's true. How you can live with it, I don't know. Now, relativism, I thought we were agreed. But Anne Whittacombe says slavery has to be considered in context. What's more relative than that? There were people at the time, Thomas Paine, Benjamin Franklin, there were innumerable humanists and secularists who said slavery is, is evil. The church wouldn't agree. Now, which is it then? Is it that the church is wrong or, even more suggestive, that God has not yet revealed that it's wrong to them? Or did God support it all, that, all those years and then change his mind? From a, from a beginning point of absurdity, you arrive at a terminal point of absolute moral chaos. And I think you've at least done us the favor of making that plain this evening. <laughs> God, in short, God did not make man in his own image. It is precisely to the contrary. Mammals and primates made many gods and many churches in their own rival images. And that would explain if these churches and faiths were invented by primates who were only half a chromosome away from a chimpanzee, which happens to be the case, it would explain a lot, would it not? Um, I can't offer you absolution. Not in my power to do it. Stephen can't offer you absolution. First of all, we think, we believe, we more or less know, there's no such thing. But if you confess your sins specifically, if you name them and don't just make them general, if you